I hope you caught the message. (laughs) Next week is Easter, and I hope you will take some time this week to find someone that needs to hear the story of Easter and invite them to be with you here next week. Maybe it's that neighbor across the street that needs somebody just to offer an invitation and they'd be willing to come. If you have your Bible, open it this morning to Luke the 23rd chapter because next week is Resurrection Sunday, but this week is the week that we deal with the triumphal entry, the Lord's Supper, the crucifixion. It was a tough week on Jesus. The cross was not easy. It wasn't easy on Jesus. It wasn't easy on the two criminals that were sacrificed with him. But you know, during that time Jesus was on the cross, one of the criminals made a change. Luke or Matthew 27 tells us that, that in the beginning, both of them were upset. Both of them were mocking Jesus, but, but somewhere along the line, the heart of one criminal was softened. Read along with me from Luke 23, beginning with verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We're punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. It was a strange day for that thief, his last day on earth. It was the worst day of his life. But suddenly, in the midst of it all, the worst day of his life becomes the best day of his life because he receives something from Jesus that no one else could offer, the free gift of salvation. I wish we knew more about him, but we don't. Oh, oh, you can go back and you can read what some historians have written about the thief on the cross. As a matter of fact, if you read the right books, you'll even find some names mentioned, but we don't really know his name. Moral tradition tells us a little bit, but it's not reliable. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of like to picture him something like this. He was born by accident. He never knew who his father was. His mother didn't know which one was his father. And during the years that he was brought up, he had a number of men come in and out of the house, and he was somewhat abused and neglected and rejected. Probably about the age of five, he was abandoned on the streets. That was quite common back then. Parents that couldn't afford kids oftentimes thought they'd do better begging by themselves than the home that they could offer them. I like to think that as he grew up, he had some kindness deep down in his heart. Maybe about the age of 12, he was not only taking care of himself, but but maybe he'd even gathered around him some of the younger kids on the street and was doing what he could to help them. And then, then the day came when he found something he hadn't seen in a long time in a trash can. He, he found a whole loaf of bread. He was so excited. A loaf of bread would feed he and his friends for a whole day. So he grabbed it quickly and he headed back towards the little hut that they lived in outside of town. But along the way, he ran into a Roman. The Roman knew that he couldn't afford the bread. And so he thought the only thing that somebody could think, that he'd stolen it. So he took it from him and threw the young boy into prison. And there he was treated unjustly again. He experienced a lot of injustices in his life, and pretty soon he learned to hate. He learned to hate the Romans, mostly. As a matter of fact, he was the type of young man that he just had no love for these foreigners from other towns. So one day, one day when he saw a Roman beating an elderly Jewish man, he jumped in to help. 
He grabbed a hold of the guard, and, and the guard pulled his sword, but somehow in the scuffle, the guard was killed, and, and now he hangs on a cross. I like to think the story went like that. Because to me, that would mean this guy didn't really deserve it. This guy really deserved God's last-minute gift of grace. Because he'd never been given a fair shake in life. He'd, he'd never really had a chance. He never got a break. But in his last breath, God gave him the greatest break of all. God righted every wrong that had ever been done in this young man's life. Maybe that's the way it went. I mean, because look at the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was always taking care of those who were overlooked in this life. If you don't believe me, just read through the Gospels. And over and over again, you find it's true that Jesus, Jesus was one who loved sinners. He was known to be a friend of prostitutes and tax collectors. Why? Because God has a heart for the down and out for the overlooked, for the undervalued. The Bible tells us in Psalms that God is the father to the fatherless. I say that this morning to, to say this. If, if you've ever felt like, like life didn't give you a fair shake, like all your life the deck's been stacked against you, and you're always treated unfair, and, and you've never really had a, a chance. I can tell you this for a fact this morning. Jesus would have liked you. And you would have liked Jesus. As you study his ministry, it becomes clear that, that Jesus constantly made time. Time for people. Time for people that have been overlooked, that have been unlovely and yet to be honest uh, I don't really think that's the way this guy's life went do you I, I mean I wish it was that he was kind of a, a, a victim all of his life because it makes me feel better that, that Jesus offered him this gift because, because somehow if he did something I could almost say he deserved it. And let's be honest. There's something inside of us that though we want it is uncomfortable with that kind of forgiveness that Jesus offered. The kind of forgiveness that says, I love you and you don't have to earn that love. Because the, the whole idea that a guy could live a criminal's life, that a guy could do wrong all of his life and at the last minute be saved. I mean, he didn't do anything to earn it. He didn't go to church every Sunday. He didn't follow the rituals. And still he gets in on a last minute pardon. It just doesn't seem fair. And so there's a part of us that really wants him to deserve it. That really wants to think that maybe somehow, somewhere, he earned what Jesus did. Because we have this false gospel going around today. And, and the truth of the matter is, in some ways, we all fall for it. We've grown up with this idea that Jesus pays the membership fee, but you and I have to pay the monthly dues. That the only way that we really get into heaven is to accept what Jesus did, of course, but then to be good and to do enough to earn it. So that one day when we stand before God, he'll say, come on in because, because you deserve it. But the truth is, none of us deserve it. The truth is this morning that there's not one person in this room. There, there's not one person in this town. There's not one person in this world 
more deserving of God's grace and forgiveness than another. And there's not one of us who has lived morally right enough that one day we're going to stand before God and get into heaven on our resume. And you know that. And I know that. But can we be honest with each other? Because sometimes if we're not careful, we look at the thief on the cross and we don't understand him because we don't think he deserved it and we think we do. And that can happen in church if you're not careful. When you come every Sunday and you say the right prayers and you sing the right songs and, and you give your offering and deep down inside you think you're doing pretty good. Be careful. Because there's a part of me and a part of me, you, that, that would like this guy to deserve God's grace. We, we like to think that sometimes, somewhere along the line, he earned it, but he didn't. He just humbly asked for it. I, I, I don't know about his life this morning, but, but, but I can imagine, and, and, and what I imagine is that his life was probably more like this. He grew up in a home with a mom and dad who loved him, when, when he was little, his mom probably said prayers with him and, and sang him to sleep at night. And his dad watched his little boy grow up, dreaming that one day his son would take over the family business. But he took it all for granted. He is, assumed he deserved it and never really appreciated all that was given to him. In fact, he, he grew up thinking that he didn't have enough. That he could do better than his parents did. And so when he was a teenager, he told his parents off and went out on his own. He'd show them. And day by day, he made it, stealing food and clothes and whatever caught his eye. After he'd been on the street for a few years, he began to get a reputation of being the tough guy, the violent guy. This probably wasn't the first time he killed a Roman soldier. As a matter of fact, he'd probably done it many times. Maybe even as a zealot, he'd been hired to do it. And that happened in that day a lot. And then one day a man found him in a back alley and took him aside and told him about a Roman soldier that had been hassling him and his family. And he said, and I want him taken care of with a wink. And so they came to terms, the time and the place. And on the day that he was supposed to, he showed up in the right place at the right time. And there was the Roman soldier all by himself, just the way the man had told him it would be. He began to sneak up behind him and take out his knife when suddenly he was surrounded by 12 Roman soldiers. It was a trap. And so he spent the last weeks of his life on death row. An angry and bitter man. Angry at the man who had set him up. Angry at the Roman soldiers that had put him here. Now he hangs on a cross. You know, the truth of the matter is, his story was probably more like that. That wasn't an uncommon scenario in those days, the, the days when the Romans occupied Jerusalem. He was a criminal and getting what he deserved. He even said that. Death on a cross. And yet he's given eternal life. So here's the question this morning. What happened? What happened during those six hours they hung there that changed him from mocking Jesus to a broken, repentant, humble heart who turned to God for help. What was it that changed this man? Because the truth of the matter is, we need the answer for that question because maybe, just maybe, it will change us too. 
What did this thief experience as he hung on a cross, as he watched Jesus die, as he listened to what Jesus said? Because we know this, we know that he was close enough to Jesus on the cross that he could have a conversation with him. So he certainly heard everything that Jesus said and saw everything that Jesus did that day. And if I had to guess, if the truth be known, I think what changed this man's heart was the prayer that Jesus prayed that day. Do you remember the prayer? The prayer he prayed for those who were doing this to him? For the religious leaders who had lied about him? For Pilate who had not had the courage to stand up and who caved in and gave them what they wanted? For the soldiers who had abused him and beaten him and tortured him and, and nailed him to a cross? You know something? At that moment, at that very moment, nobody understood what Jesus was going through better than that thief. Because he'd been abused at the hands of the same soldiers. And so as he watched Jesus, the man that was nailed to the cross next to him. He hears him pray. And what's he pray for? He prays for forgiveness. This is Jesus' prayer. Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. I mean, think about that for a minute. If you're that thief. And you look at Jesus, he doesn't pray for their destruction. He didn't pray for the wrath of God to come down upon them, and he could have. Up in heaven, there were legions of angels standing with their hands on their sword, just waiting for the word to rain down wrath from heaven. But Jesus doesn't pray for wrath. He prays for grace. Now let me ask you a question. If you're a thief on a cross, what do you do with that? How do you handle that, that kind of love, that kind of grace? I think that's what wrecked the thief. (laughs) I think that's what changed everything. Because he's on a cross too, and he's angry, and he's bitter, and he's mad at the Romans, and he's mad at the occupation, and if he had prayed, he knew what he would pray for but not Jesus. So at first, in his bitterness, he mocked Jesus, just like the other thief. But then he hears Jesus extend forgiveness even to those who had treated him so badly. And that shook him. And something happened when he witnessed that kind of grace, when he witnessed that kind of love. At that moment, his heart changed. And he does something that that, that Peter had run away from. He did something that, that Pilate had washed his hands of. He did something that the the, the apostles were hiding from. The only one that day, as Jesus hung on the cross, that stood up for him was the thief on the cross next to him. And he says this, we deserve punished, we are punished justly because we're getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Do you know what that is? Look, look at that verse again with me. We're punished justly for we're getting what we deserve, but this man has nothing, done nothing wrong. That's the gospel in a nutshell. I'm getting what I deserve. I am a sinner, and I'm getting what I have coming to him, but he did nothing wrong, and yet he's taking my punishment on himself. And then he shows faith in Jesus. He says this, he says, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. What's that mean? It means that this thief on the cross suddenly comes to the realization Jesus really is a king. He is a perfect king. 
And he says, Jesus, I want to be a part of that too. I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want your salvation. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And, and this is what Jesus tells him. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. And so, on this morning when we remember his triumphal entry, when we remember his crucifixion, let me ask you this. Have you ever had a moment like that with Jesus? Have you ever had a moment when you repented of your sins? When, when you said to God, I know what I deserve. But I don't want what I deserve. I want to be a part of your kingdom. Have you ever had a moment like that? There's an old song that we used to sing when I was a boy. It was called, Were You There? Any of you ever sang that? So it's a song that asks the question, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were, were you there when they nailed him to a tree? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? And, and I was always kind of struck by the challenge of that to song, to, to, to put yourself in that place. To, to put yourself at the crucifixion and to ask yourself, what would you have done? And I'm not the only one to have that thought. I'm, I'm sure several of you have at a time. I, I know people through history have had that thought. Have you looked at your bulletin this morning? If you've got your bulletin, take it out. If not, we're going to put it up on the screen here today. Because, because on your bulletin is a picture. It's a picture of Rembrandt's crucifixion. You've probably seen it before at one time or another. I know I had. But there's something strange about that picture that I would never noticed before until this last week I was studying and I read in a book and I said, you're kidding. And I went back and I looked this picture up. Do you see what's strange in the picture? There's one strange character in the picture. He, he's on the left side, right by the thief on the cross. And he's not dressed in first century clothes. In fact, he's got a big hat with a feather. Any guesses who that is? That's Rembrandt. He painted himself into the picture of the crucifixion. So here's my question to you. Where would you paint yourself in the picture if you had a chance? I think Rembrandt put himself in the right place. He put himself right next to the thief on the cross. And you know why he put himself there? Because I think Rembrandt said, I can relate to that guy. That's my story. I have a lot in common with him. Because the thief recognized his own sin and what he deserved. And it broke him. And I know what that's like. And so do you, if you're honest. Because we've all looked at ourselves in the mirror and not liked what we were looking at. We've all looked at ourselves in the mirror and realized that we're a sinner. And we're getting what we deserve. And we're humbled. Oh, I, I also know what it is to make excuses, and so do you. You know, you look at that guy in the mirror, and you don't really like what you see, but you say to yourself, but he's better than most of the people I know. I'm not that bad. And I've looked at the guy in the mirror, and I've rationalized. So have you. I've said to myself, well, well it's not really my fault. It's the way I was raised. It's the society that we live in today. That's just what people do. 
But it's not until we come to that day when we recognize that we're sinners and that we're getting what our sin deserves, that everything begins to change. And so if, if I were going to put myself by anybody, I kind of like Rembrandt would put myself next to the thief on the cross. Because he realized he was guilty and what he deserved. And I realized this, I, I, I can't be disciplined enough. I, I'll admit that to you this morning. I cannot be righteous enough. I cannot be honest enough to get into heaven on my own. The only chance I have is just like that thief to humbly ask God for help. It seems so presumptuous, doesn't it? That a thief who lived a miserable life at the hour of his death would turn to Jesus and expect something he didn't deserve. But he got it. When he asked, he got it. Because Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, someday when I I, I get to heaven, and like I've said here before, I, I believe this morning I'm going to heaven without a shadow of the doubt in my mind but only because it has nothing to do with me and everything to do with what Jesus did for me. And one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to meet a man who I've never known, but whose story I know real well. And I'm going to walk up to him and I'm going to say, you know, you don't know me, but I know you. And I know what you did, and I did it too. And for that reason... I'm here today because what Jesus did for you, he did for me. We have a lot in common with that thief on the cross, whether you knew it or not. And that's who we want to be. That's who we ought to be painted beside. But, but let me ask you this. How many of us would be painted on the other side? Let's talk just for a second about that guy. The guy that made excuses. The guy that pretty much blamed God. And turned to Jesus and said, if you are God, then straighten my life out. He doesn't turn to Jesus humbly. He turns to him in anger. You you know what I found as a minister? That, That really, there are only two choices. You're either one thief or you're the other this morning. You're either the person today who has said to God, God, if you don't straighten my life out, then I don't want any part of you. Or you're the guy that turns to God and says, God, I can't straighten my life out. But would you help me anyway? You know what the greatest day of my life was? the day that I realized that I don't have to earn God's love. The the, the day that I heard a preacher stand up in front and, and I can remember the day to this very day and I've used the line over and over again because, because it finally got through to me. When this man said this to me, he said, do you understand that if you live a perfect day today, which is almost impossible for you, but if you could pull it off and never do anything wrong this this whole day, when you lay down in your bed tonight and put your head on your pillow, God won't love you anymore. But if you mess up royally, and you bomb out today, and you do the worst things that you could ever think of doing, when you lay your head on your pillow tonight, God won't love you any less. He just loves you. And when I finally came to that realization that I don't have to earn God's love, it changed everything. 
Oh, it didn't give me permission to go out and do what I want. I don't do that. Because I wouldn't hurt God for anything in the world. It changed my attitude because I realized God loves me no matter what. And now I can love him no matter what. Which are you this morning? Are you the one who says to God, when you straighten out the mess, then I'll give you my life? Or are you the one today who says, God, I know I don't deserve it. I know I will never deserve it. But come into my life. You're one or the other. And you'll make that decision again this morning as to what you're going to be as we stand and sing our invitation hymn together. Well, won't you decide to follow Jesus today? Thank you for your kind attention. We had a very exciting and very full day planned today. Uh, right after church this morning, for all of our kids and their parents, if you just make your way downstairs, uh, we have lunch already prepared for you. We're going to have uh, pizza and salad and desserts. And then we're going to take some time to color some Easter eggs uh, that are down there. We're going to celebrate today. And then after that, we're going out to the Brills home out on, let's see, is it? Eakins, Eakins Road, and uh, at 2 o'clock this afternoon, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt out there for the kids, so uh, we'll be going there right after lunch and right after the coloring, and then coming back here for uh, Awanas tonight at 5.30, also youth meeting tonight, small groups here at the church, so a lot of things going on today. 3 o'clock this afternoon, 2 o'clock is the Easter egg hunt, 3 o'clock is our elders meeting here at the church, and then uh, tonight, right after evening services, will be our board meeting. So that was postponed from last week to this week. All right. Any other announcements? Don't forget to be signing up for our missions trip. Yeah. To next week is the cutoff date. So if you're going to sign up, you need to sign up this week or next week. And we're having... Um, Cantata rehearsal this afternoon at four, so we need a couple guys to help us set up either right after church or like quarter to four today. Okay. okay. So I think that's it. And, and, and I want to thank our, our worship team this morning, who uh, many of them are out at Mount, Olive, or Mount uh, Pleasant today for, for the cantata that's out there. Our group is meeting with their group. 
Uh, and so they came, but they wanted to be a part of our worship service before they left. And so we're thankful for that, too. And that's this Friday, so don't forget, everybody come. This yeah, Friday 7 at 7. o'clock. 7 Friday. o'clock, yeah. So 7 o'clock Friday night, we're going to have a good Friday service uh, with a cantata here at the church. So mm-hmm. 7 o'clock on Friday evening. If you can't make it, we're going to put it on TV for you, okay? So uh, if you can't be here, turn on your TV at 7 to local station, and uh, it should be on. Okay, any other announcements? If not, let's close together in prayer. Now, Father, we are in awe this morning of your love. A love so great and so deep and so high and so wide that it would reach through the ages, not just to a thief on a cross, but to us here today. And say to us, if you'll only... If you only accept the gift, I want you to live with me forever. Oh, Father, at this season of the year, when we remember the gift that Jesus gave, help us, Lord, to share that gift with others. So that next week, maybe that neighbor across the street or the one next door will be here with us because we took the time to share you. Help us to do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.